so just a quick uh, snapshot. I just have a one slide overview about our company. Uh, like I told you, uh, what, what you would be doing or what you would have done over the last few weeks as part of this program is you would probably be using demographic data for analytics, right? You're probably looking at employee data from HRMS, HMIS, right? Or an MIS system. And then you're kind of running some regression and you're trying to look for patterns. That's what we call, you know, pattern matching or pattern recognition. So a lot of uh, analytics, right, is based on pattern recognition and pattern matching algorithms. Okay, so that's one way of analyzing data. So what we have is another way of analyzing data. Uh, in fact, uh, any any HRMS data or any demographic data, we call that secondary data. Okay, and any assessment based data, we call that primary data. So the the approach that we have taken to build this product is leveraging primary data, which is uh, what we actually do is instead of going and look at the, looking at HRMS and then kind of uh, you know, calling out all your HRMS data and running that through some kind of, uh, you know, statistic. Uh, what we do is we kind of ask you to do a self-assessment and you also kind of get four or five people that you work closely with to give you feedback. And then the assessment data becomes the basis for analytics. Okay? So that's the second approach. So why is it that we take this approach? So over the last five years, we have been doing a lot of research on, uh, on what are the, or, or if I may, what is the flip side of using demographic data? So, any, 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 any thoughts that come to you? What is the flip side of using HRMS data for people analytics? Or, or let's, let's, let's kind of do this. What are the pros and cons of using demographic data or HRMS data for people analytics? You may not have complete data. Okay. Trend is something that you'll have to look for, right? So pattern recognition, pattern matching is something that an algorithm will do or you do by running, you know, the data through some kind of statistical analysis, right? So what, what is the, what is the advantage of using HRMS data? Yeah, so that's the output, right? That's the outcome. See, any database decision is better than an intuition based decision or a hunch based decision, right? So that's the, that's the object of, of leveraging data. The question is, what are the pluses and what are the minuses of using HRMS data? For example, I have a I have an HRMS and I have demographic data like uh, my employee's age, designation, years of experience, functional expertise, technical expertise, right? Number of promotions, whatever it is, right? I have a whole lot of uh, uh, data points that I can <coughs> analyze. So, what's the advantage of this? Accuracy. It is accurate because you would have vetted it, right? Maybe during the time of joining or thereafter, you would have vetted it. So, you are assuming that it is. Predominantly accurate. Sorry. sorry. That's post analysis. Yeah, you have a good understanding of the employee, right? Yeah. So, in some sense, yes. Yeah. What else can you think of? Absolutely. It's readily available, right? You don't have to kind of go looking for data. Isn't it? It's all available there in your database. So somebody will give you a CSV output or somebody will give you an Excel output, right? What else? What's missing can also be found. Uh, let's, let's say somebody's uh, age is missing. So, so that's kind of a debatable topic, right? Okay. All right. So the reason why we, we uh, the reason why we adopted the assessment data based approach to people analytics is that see there is something called uh, the three V's right so all of you have been uh, have you been uh, kind of uh, learning about big data and what is big data what qualifies as big data and things like that so there is something called a uh, so any big data right is characterized by three V's what is three V's velocity variety. What is absolutely volume, right? So I would I would uh, recommend you guys uh, to go and look up this article in HBR that says there is no such thing as big data in HR. Okay. So when we are looking at your HRMS system, let's 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 assume that because Infosys is a new software, let's take Infosys. Okay. So uh, we we kind of were told that there are about two lakh employees in Infosys. So if you were to be given the HRMS of all the employees at Infosys. How many records would you have? How many records would you have? How many data points would you have? 
Sorry? No, I'm, I'm giving you the number of employees, right? Assuming that there are 200,000 employees at Infosys, how many data points would you have? And okay, let's assume that there are 50 data points, right? Like, like, like for example, age is one data point. So how many data points would you have? And let's assume that you're trying to find out uh, the cause for attrition. That's pro that, that seems to be some big topic, right? So let's assume that you're trying to find out what's the cause for attrition or what's the cause for rise in attrition over the last two quarters. That's what you're trying to figure out. So how many data points are you dealing with? Yeah, 20 to 50. Right? Okay, now the question is, does that qualify as big data? Okay, the answer is no. Pattern recognition, pattern matching works well when you have huge volumes of data and only when the data is qualified by these three characteristics, right? The velocity, the volume and the variety. So sometimes, in fact, I was just having a chat with uh, one of the uh, HR heads in a company. So they were actually trying to find out, uh, you know, who is quitting the company. So they kind of looked at how many people quit the company over the last one year and they kind of jumped, jumped to the conclusion that people between 24 and 26 are more prone to quitting, right? Just by looking at 30 people, you decided 24 to 26 people quit. Now what is happening is in the process of leveraging data, you're actually misleading your companies. You can't just look at 30 people who quit over the last one year and say people between 24 and 26 are quitting. So why doesn't this work? This doesn't work because pattern ma matching, pattern recognition works well only when you are dealing with big data, not otherwise. You have to have huge volumes of data. For example, you might probably want to look at how many people, what is the attrition in the Indian IT industry? Maybe you have enough data points. Or what is the cause for attrition uh, in, in the Indian uh, pharma industry? Because you are actually dealing with really terabytes of data. Okay, so that's it. So that's the reason based on this research that we did over the last four or five years, we said, you know what, when there is no such thing as big data in HR, it really does not make sense for us to look for patterns, right? So that's why we said, why don't we take this approach? Anyway, so that's what it is. And uh, uh, we are being incubated as part of the Startup India Initiative. Uh, we are also registered with the Karnataka Startup Initiative. And uh, as of now, we have about nine customers. We are a, we are a one year old company. And uh, we work with nine customers in about five countries. Uh, another uh, interesting thing is that we also had the golden opportunity to present our analytics platform to uh, the Prime Minister's office. Uh, so whether they use it or not is a next thing, right? But uh, the officers on special duty there are looking at how can they use assessment and analytics to enhance the efficiency of secretaries and ministries. I know it sounds like a dream, but uh, <laughs> but but at least at least they're thinking about it. Okay, so let's feel good about it, right? Whether they do it or not, a second thing. And uh, we we also made quite a few paper presentations at uh, uh, several uh, international BA conferences, business analytics conferences, at IIM Bangalore, at uh, Indian Institute of Science, and so on. And uh, so uh, the, the 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 latest development is that uh, uh, the the government of Karnataka is conducting an initiative called Elevate Hundred. So the objective of this initiative is to identify the top hundred innovative companies across Karnataka. So we have been uh, shortlisted for the final round uh, out of some 1800 companies. So we have made it to the top uh, 250. So hopefully we'll make it to the top 100, right? So that's about it. So what we'll do now is, uh, so all of you have completed your assessment, right? Okay, I didn't get switch. Does it take a while to refresh or something? Okay, so, so all of you have gone through a 360 degree process, right? So you have done your self-assessment and uh, you have also received feedback from three to five or seven or eight people. Now, what I, I have done is, I have actually compiled all your data. So if you actually look at it, when I, when I kind of collate the 360 degree feedback that all of you have received, in some sense what I actually have is a 360 degree view of the group. Yeah? Make sense? When I roll up all your 360 degree feedback data, I have the 360 degree view of the group. So what we are doing in the back end is we are actually running some algorithms on that data to start making predictions about this group. Okay. So let's see what this group looks like. Okay. Uh, so I have only these 11 people as part of the analytics because those people have completed their assessment. Okay. 
Now, this is what we call a people analytics dashboard. Another challenge that we found with uh, using uh, demographic data is that it's kind of unstructured, right? So you'll have to kind of make it structured and then you'll have to create a dashboard so that you can present it to people. You can present it to stakeholders, you can present it to decision makers, right? So that's another challenge that we found. So we said, why don't we create an out of the box dashboard, right? So that decision makers have to just look at the dashboard. They don't have to worry about what is this data? Where is it coming from? How do I gather the, the data? So what about the sanctity of the data? I don't have to worry about all those things, right? I just have a, dis a dashboard and I, I make my decisions by looking at the dashboard, okay? So this is what we call a people analytics dashboard. Now, what I've done here, uh, just for the uh, sake of demo is, I have created some dummy groups, okay? So typically in an organization, what we do when we work with organizations is we replicate the org hierarchy. So if you have project teams, you'll see project teams there, right? Or if you have functional teams, you'll, you'll see functional teams there and so on. Okay. So what I've done now is I have created a group uh, that says participants and I have created another group called faculties and only Shino is there. So I just put two other dummy names there so that I don't uh, uh, expose Shino's course to you. Because one, one thing that we follow here is we don't expose individual ratings to anybody. Even if you are a manager, you'll not be able to see your, because it becomes a witch hunting tool. You'll use it for everything other than development. Right? So we don't want that to be the object. So let's start with participants. So, so that's the first thing that I do. If I'm a manager, I get a dashboard like this, and this becomes my decision support system, right? So what I do next is I actually go and pick what data I want to use for my analytics. Now, because the whole group has gone through this 360, now the group has feedback from different stakeholders, right? So all of you invited your managers, your direct reports, your peers, your customers, vendors. So what I can actually do here is I can say, I want to analyze this group based on the feedback given by, uh, let's say all stakeholders. I can do that. I'm, I'm only selecting or choosing the data that I want to use for my analytics. Is something wrong with the internet? Yes. Oh, okay, yeah, thank you. And what we can also do, we didn't do this uh, because of uh, several constraints. What we can also do is whatever demographic data, this is where we use demographic data. We don't use data, demographic data for analytics, but we use demographic data for slice and dice. So for example, if I want to analyze a particular section of these nine people, these 12 people, I do that by using demographic data as my filters. So what we have done is we have, we have used or we are, we are giving the users the ability to use demographic data as filters so that you can actually do a very finer level of analytics. By that I mean, I want to analyze, uh, I mean, I'm just giving you a random example. I, I only want to analyze people in this room who have a PhD degree. That's where I use this, okay. So, all right. Now, so what you see here on the right side is, these are all the features that are available to you uh, so that you kind of can get deeper insight about your team and you can kind of make better informed people decisions about your team. So the first simple thing that you do here is go and look at the SWOT of this team. Now, please remember everything that you're seeing here is at the group level. Okay, it's not at an individual level. There are certain sections where you'll actually look, you'll see individual names, but we'll come to that a little later. So what we're actually trying to do here is we are looking at what is the SWOT of this group. Now, the reason why we have built this feature is when we kind of spoke, spoke to managers across, across industries, we found that these managers were aware of individual strengths and individual weaknesses. For example, 20 people reporting to them, I know that this is the strength of this guy and this is the weakness of this person, right? But collectively, I have no idea where the group stands. So for example, we did a very uh, very quick test like we, 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 we asked a manager to, to kind of list the group's strengths and weaknesses in 30 seconds. And how many people do you think were able to do it? We, we spoke to at least about 30 senior managers who were, uh, who were into management, who have been leading teams of at least 50 people, 100 people, 200 people, and even some people who are managing teams as small as 10 people, 20 people. So we said, in the next 30 seconds, can you please list as many strengths and weaknesses as you can about your group? Nobody was able to say more than one strength, one weakness. We are talking about the group. And then you're telling the same managers, you have to increase their productivity, increase their efficiency. How will they do? They have no clue about the group. So we said, can we kind of give the SWOT analysis to the manager so that they have an understanding of where the group stands, right, as a unit. So what are your strengths? The strengths of this group? 
Okay, structured is when it comes to learning. Okay, you will make nice timetables. Okay, nice folder structure. Yeah, the smiles mean you do that, <laughs> right? And and yeah, we have put this through all kinds of reliability validity, so it's it's bound to be accurate. Okay, so that I can tell you. Okay, so you are very structured in your learning, understanding. So all of you have this inclination to go deep into topics and get a good understanding of whatever you learn. So it's not that you just come here and go back. You're you're really interested in digging deeper and understanding what is being taught here. Make sense? Anybody who says you know what it really doesn't matter. And credibility is, I mean, this is definitely good to have a system. So, a lot of you believe in keeping your commitments. You walk the talk, right? So, if you made a commitment, you will do your best to make sure that you deliver as you have committed, right? So, those are your strengths. Okay, now, what are the weaknesses of this group? Authenticity. Whenever you are sharing opinions, you don't seem to be able to back it up with data. Hey, I don't think we should have one-hour sessions. Why? Um, no, no, I don't think we should have one hour session, right? So I'm, I'm just giving you a random example, right? So, but what it actually says is whenever you're sharing opinions, whenever you're sharing feedback, you're not able to back it up with data, okay? So for that reason, you may or may not be taken seriously. Your opinions may or may not be taken seriously because people are not sure why you're making an opinion, why you're making a suggestion, why you're making a recommendation, right? Influence is low. What does it mean? Influence is low. Were you working as uh, teams? How many of you were working as teams? All of you were in teams? Were you able to tell the other person exactly want, what you want and get it done when you want it? How many of you are able to do it? When influence is low, what happens is I am not able to influence people and events to get what I want. Right? So, what does that mean? I'll just again give you a very simple random example. Let's say that the three of us are working as part of a team. If I want something from her, I will go to Shinu. You got what I, what I mean, right? That's what happens when the influence is low. Okay. I'm just trying to interpret it for this group. Now, I, I just want you to imagine what happens if this is a team in an organization. Correct? So what happens if the influence is low in a team? Things don't move, right? And for every small thing, you go to the big boss, wasting his or her time in the process. Right? For everything, I mean, there's no way I can, I'm not assertive enough to push you. You're not assertive enough to push me. So, for every small little thing, we run to Shinu in this case. Right? That's what it means when the influence is low. Absolutely. You know what happens? That's a very, very interesting scenario. What what will happen if, okay, let's assume that I am a leader or let's, let's take the example of this group. My credibility is high. My influence is very low. All of us would have at some point in time seen a manager who will let the team members go home at 5 o'clock roll up his or her sleeves and work till 9 o'clock and send a report. You have seen a manager like that? If I am not assertive, what do I do? I can't, you will come and say, boss, you know what, my daughter is not well, I have to get back home. Say, okay, boss. Somebody will come and say, boss, I just have to go to this meeting, I will come back and I will send you, send the report. Now 9 o'clock, nobody is there, what, the, what will the boss do? Boss's credibility is very high. Boss has to keep a commitment, but the boss is not influential enough to get people to do what he or she wants. So what will he do? Say, so, okay, boss, I'll send the report. Next time you have to send it down. Okay, I'm telling you. This is the last time I'm doing it. Right? That's what happens when the boss is not assertive enough. But credibility is very high. I will, it's like Pran Jaya or Vachanna Jaya. Right? These are guys who are very high on credibility but low on influence. Right? So that's what happens with you. So, I'll do the report. The report, send it to Dr. Shinno at 1 o'clock. Right? So that's what happens. So in a team, you can see how this kind of plays out. Right? Isn't it? So, there is a last minute rush, things are not moving as per you expect them to move because you are not able to assert each other. You think that, oh God, if I push this guy, what will he think? What will she think? Maybe they will think that I am too bossy or I am trying to interfere in the affairs. Whatever belief systems you have, right? What else? Expression is low. We have found that this is more a, uh, this is more a cultural thing, right? So, because we also work with uh, companies in uh, Malaysia, we also work with companies in uh, Singapore. So, what we have found as a common thread is that Culturally, Asia is low in expression. We, we are not, we are not, I mean, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm not a racist, but if you look at how Americans express, they're very expressive, right? If you've seen an, an Asian expressing and an American expressing, they're very expressive. Whether they mean it or not, that's secondary, okay? But they're very expressive. 
So what we have found that is it's more of a cultural thing. Okay, so not to worry that. <coughs> so these are sorry opportunities are like your second layer of strengths. Okay. So what that, what that means is with a little bit of focus, all these can actually be the strengths of this group, which means you are doing fairly well here, but there is definitely scope for improvement. That's what it means. So what are you good at? You are good at prioritization, especially when you are working on new ideas or new initiatives. You have an understanding of when to do what. So you are good at prioritizing your activities. Okay. People involvement, you also have a good sense of each other. You understand each other's capabilities, you understand each other's strengths. So you understand who can do what, who cannot do what. Right. So you have a good, like I said, these are your second level of strengths. You are fairly okay here, but there is scope for improvement. With a little bit of focus, you can actually get better here. And finally, you also are good at aspiration. So all of you have a lot of ideas. You may not be, I mean, great on ideas, but all of you have some ideas. So you want to do some some new things. You want to do something better. So that's what your uh, aspirations is. And finally, we are also looking at what are those areas where a group where the group has a tendency to overdo. All of us have this tendency to overdo things, right? So what is it that you tend to overdo? Conviction is very strong. Wow, this is a very strong group. I mean, it's 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 really good to have. What does it mean to have very strong conviction? It means that you stand by your opinions. For example, if 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 I push you to a corner, you'll say, "Yes, I I said this over." So, which is a good sign because when conviction is high, there's no scope for politics. That's how we look at it when we are working with organizations, right? If this conviction is low, what does it mean? I'll say, "Hey, you know what? I I don't think you should uh, trust Shinu. So, no, Shinu Shinu comes here." Hey, Prabhat, you said that, right? Oh, no, 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 that's not what I said. Maybe you interpreted me wrongly. This is what happens with most politicians, right? Oh, no, 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 you got it wrong. That's not what I meant. But you said it. So when your conviction is low, what happens is you will not stand by your own opinions. Right? If the stakes are high, to save your skin, you will go back on what you said. But if conviction is very high, what will it mean? It becomes my way, my way or highway. So for everything, we are actually looking at are you over skilled there or are you under skilled there or are you rightly skilled. For us, strength means those are the areas where you or your team is rightly skilled. Under skilled is needs improvement. Over skilled is you don't have to do anything here. You are only saying that threats are areas where the group needs to be conscious about. You just have to be aware that you have this tendency to stick by or stick to your uh, opinion so strongly that you will probably start initiating conflicts for no reason. When somebody is very strong on something, you see that their tendency to initiate a conflict is very high. Okay. Now, task involvement. Okay, now this is an interesting thing. How many of you have heard managers, leaders saying, "Yeah, this team is very tactical. It's not strategic." What does that mean? Which means that the team has a tendency to get stuck with minute details and lose sight of the bigger picture. I am actually putting borders for my Excel spreadsheet instead of completing the course. Right? Hey, it's okay. It's okay if your Excel does not have a border. That's fine. Please complete the program. No, no, no. This Excel sheet should have this border, and it should be red. It should be two point. So what happens sometimes is that while it is good to be detail oriented, sometimes what happens when we get too caught up with minor details, we might lose sight of the bigger picture. I'm not saying that it will happen. If we have a tendency to get caught up with micro details, we we'll lose sight of the macro picture. That's usually the tendency. Okay. So that's what it means. And finally, again, very, very meticulous in planning. Hey, boss, enough of planning. Start the project. No, no, no. You should get this plan, right? Wait, just wait. You're still planning. That's fine. Your planning is done. You can plan along the way. No, 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 no. Please wait. You have to put it in a presentation, show it to everybody, right? Then come back, make changes to this plan. Only then we'll start. Otherwise, no, right? Right? So, I mean, so there is. See, please understand. There's no good or bad about anything here. It is just that this is how the group is. This is the group's tendency. So all that we kind of tell people when we work with organizations is, this is where you stand. What you want to do with it is up to you. We are only telling you this is the tendency of the group. This is what they tend to uh, overdo. This is what they tend to not do. Things like that. Okay. Now <clears throat> you can also go and look at what is the group's SWOT when it comes to your ability to achieve results. Right. So when it comes to your ability to achieve results, aspiration is a strength. <coughs> which means all of you have ideas. Optimization is your weak area. What does that mean? That means that the group does not look at 
how do i get more with less are we being smart workers or are we being hard workers for example you kind of, uh, maybe somebody give you give you a regression analysis uh, exercise or an assignment and you kind of burnt the midnight midnight oil next day you showed it to ramesh he said hey i had a plug in it could do that for you for t- in 10 minutes why didn't you oh okay fine right i mean so the idea is is there a smarter way of achieving my goals or am i slogging okay now please understand we are only looking at your ability to achieve results okay not overall okay we are looking specifically at that opportunity is time sense i mean whenever you are working on new ideas initiatives i think uh, time sense is something that you are pretty good at but i think that needs improvement and planning is a threat again what you see here is you are overdoing it right you have a tendency to uh, it's like uh, what do you say you say striking all t's and dotting all i's or whatever right so you you plan to that extent now let's look at something that is specific to this program when it comes to your ability to learn and apply what you learn what is your swap again i told you this group is for you it is very important to understand what you learn you want to have a good grasp you want to have a good hold of what you learn that's very important for you now weakness is initiative let me tell you okay let's say that this you have this i think saturday sessions right saturday let's say something gets discussed okay for example uh, let's take this scenario so just now i told you if you look at uh, uh, you know the global approaches to people analytics i told you there are there is this primary data approach there is the secondary data approach right so how many of you will go back and google this is the question if this is low it means that not more than 5% of you will go and google, google it you say ah oh, that's okay he said something we heard it fine next time somebody says oh yeah yeah correct yeah okay so initiative means do i create learning opportunities for myself do i go back explore come back and say hey i think you said this it doesn't make sense right so that doesn't happen when your initiative is low but understanding is very high whatever is taught here is like you you get it right you understand it very well do you go back explore no that doesn't happen that will happen only in the next session and that to here in this room <laughs> that's what this means okay huh? <laughs> so time for learning again so time for learn time for learning all of you somehow managed to make time for learning but it is definitely not high priority for you ah uh, thoda time mil gaya that assignment no 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 we'll do that later hey boss i think we should do that it's on your mind you know that you know you have to do that assignment but but still you tend to keep putting it off because it's not your strength there is some scope for improvement here finally threat is structured my god so whether whether you learn something or not if you can take a piece of paper neatly draw a table and write the time table you are very happy with that because you structured so what i'm saying is sometimes instead of doing so much here you can probably use that in in this one so instead of spending so much time planning your learning and all those things you can actually go and look up and uh, learn more about that same topic you understand where your time is going right you don't have to be so structured i mean it's not needed maybe you are actually overdoing this at the cost of this correct instead of spending 10 uh, minutes to create that border and all those things or create a learning plan so 10 minutes go look up and see what are the different types of analytics available so sometimes what happens is you trade one for the other right in a in an operation scenario so that's where your your productivity dips okay so that is the kind of analytics that we do all right so and then what we uh, we also have this uh, so again so i'm sure you would have heard this uh, uh, you know these three are probably the most uh, cliched terms when you talk about analytics you talk about diagnostic you talk about predictive you talk about prescriptive right now i don't know how many of you know there is also something called there is also something called autonomous now we are actually looking at building autonomous analytics now what is what is diagnostic like i was telling you i don't know if i if you remember diagnostic is more like a rear view mirror how many people quit my organization in the last 6 months that's diagnostic right or what is the swot analysis of my team diagnostic diagnostic analytics alone will not help you in decision making now 50 people quit your organization last 5 5 uh, months the question is so what right okay five of them are managers again the question is so what so diagnostic will only inform you it's only informative the second is what we call predictive now predictive is okay now if i made offers to 10 people how many of them are likely to join and what is the confidence level with which i can say these many people can join right that's predictive or let's say that i have a team of 20 people and i'm getting a new manager what will be the impact can i predict the impact of this new hire that's predictive what is prescriptive 
what is prescriptive sorry course of action so it's like you are actually expecting the system to give you some kind of recommendation right for example you have shortlisted three people you want to know who would be the best fit for your team right now as we talk about machine learning and ai and things like that there is this fourth level of analytics that's coming up that's called autonomous so in fact we are actually trying to build a feature so when you look at predictive and prescriptive you're still expecting a human being to take a decision right correct the system will only prescribe but the system will not make a decision on your behalf now with ai coming in we are actually looking at the next level can the system make and execute the decision that's autonomous what does that mean so one of the things that we are working on is now how many uh, organizations that you work with make campus size you do campus recruitment right you do campus recruitment so typically what happens is now this is one feature that we are kind of researching and we are building so typically what happens is you let's assume that you hire 300 people right and you put them through some kind of a ramp up plan ramp up program whatever it is so at the end of 3 months you have to allocate them to different projects right yeah so the question is how do you allocate them now all of you know that these 300 people are pretty much on par they're pretty much on par right are they any different in terms of expertise in terms of knowledge in terms of skills are they any different drastically different right they are pretty much on par now how do you allocate them to let's say 30 project teams so what we are trying to do now is we are trying to build an algorithm which will kind of look at the profiles of these 300 people and look at the 30 teams and look at the profiles of these 30 people and automatically automatically assign these 300 people to those 30 teams that's autonomous so as a as a as a talent analyst or as a talent acquisition spe specialist or as an hr manager you don't have to worry about anything you just have to put those 300 people on this side and say these are the 30 people where these 300 people will go and the system will run an algorithm will find out who fits where best and it will make the movement and give you a report that's autonomous right so that's the next level okay so now what we have done here is uh, i will kind of quickly walk you through this one yeah sure sure no 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 i will tell you i'll go. correct so uh, when i take you through your report we will kind of talk more about each of those terms so you got your report right you would have seen the same terms there if you have had a chance to see your report you would see the same words there so there are 30 attributes that we measure like i told you this is an assessment based analytics right so so it's a 30 item questionnaire i don't know if you remember when you when you responded to your questionnaire you answered 30 questions so when you when you invited uh, people to give you feedback they would have rated you on the same 30 questions so each question there on the questionnaire in the back end is mapped to an attribute and what you are seeing here is those 30 attributes okay so i'll i'll come to that so maybe when we walk you through the report so what we have done here is again if you look at it from an organizational perspective right uh, so people will definitely have the kind of questions that you have for example it's like you are talking about 30 attributes it doesn't make sense to me how do i relate to it so what we do in most of the uh uh kind of uh, when we work with organizations is that we tell them what is the impact of this on let's say for example the quality or what's the impact on uh, of this on your innovation or what's the impact of this on your productivity levels your utilization levels right or your attrition so that's the interpretation that we do for them so what we have done here for example is we have taken those 30 attributes and we have put them into three categories what we are actually looking at is as a group what is your execution capabilities execution capabilities is take something and deliver that's execution what's your level of engagement now engagement is in everything that you do how involved are you how engaged are you okay and finally discipline is what is your ability to plan and what is your ability to time your decisions so that's how we have grouped them okay now what we have done here is in fact this feature is a is an example of a blend of predictive and prescriptive so in each of these areas we are actually predicting that these are the two potential problem areas for this group that's what we are predicting we are saying that this is where the group is likely to have problems in this particular area this is where the group is likely to have problems in this area and so on okay now here again you can drill down and then find out what does it mean to have these areas as problem areas for your team for your group i told you what happens when your influence is low right i i'm not i'm not assertive enough to get things done so what will happen is things will not move as quickly as we want them to move right now if you go and look at the group's level of engagement like i said 
if you look at all these attributes there are seven attributes here each attribute is indicating how involved are you in everything that you do it could be with your task right it could be with your learning it could be in your relationships what is your extent of involvement that's, that's what it's showing and out of these seven areas we are saying these are the two low areas now this is an interesting scenario right how many of you go back and apply what you learn the question integration is low means that very very few of you or probably none of you will go back and apply what you learn you learn it great good understanding job done i will continue to do i will go back my hr manager says do this thing i will do those things i will not go and say hey you know what i learned this i think we should use that here that's integration right so your theory and practicals is compartmentalized what i learn should be in this compartment what i'm doing is in this compartment right so if you want to derive the true benefit of your learning and if you want to really grow this has to go up right because you guys if you remember all of you have this ability to understand concepts very well you saw that understanding came up as a strength but integration is coming up as a weak area which means all of you can actually shinu is not here i'll say that all of you can actually become very good professors in reva university you can be very good professors you can say this is how you run regression this is how you do aggression right <laughs> okay but if you really want to go back and make an impact right if you want to kind of make a difference to your your job your work then you have to find ways to apply your learning okay otherwise people don't even know that you went through this process are you oh go eight weeks event came there still doing the same thing what happened right so your your integration has to go up but okay. finally when it comes to your ability to plan and also your ability to time your decisions now context sensitivity that's again uh, let's not worry about it again time for learning is something that you'll have to look at unless you treat learning as a priority you'll keep finding excuses you'll you'll always be busy for so many things right you can keep saying that i'm i'm very busy ramya oh okay so finally you managed to do your uh, yeah so that had to happen yesterday right so which is good but what i'm saying is had you done it earlier probably you would have had more time to go through the report and things like that right that's time for learning right so i mean uh, sorry because I, i don't want to point fingers at anyone but that's that's applicable to the whole group i i remembered this because this was the most recent thing that happened so okay so what i'm actually saying is that if you think that we are very busy so with work with deliverables right with team with family then definitely learning takes a back seat okay right okay um this is i i will i will not go into too much of details here because uh, this this kind of makes more sense when we are working with uh, organizations so uh, this is another uh, uh, again this feature we built this based on the research again that we have been doing for the last few years what we found was that in in uh, organizations across industries over a period of time these review meetings become rituals how many of you sit through review meetings same slide same 10 slides same first slide same second slide same third slide in fact if you are doing the review meeting if you are the one who is creating the slides what will you do ah uh, this time go to slide 4 change that uh, date from 28 to 27 are uh, review meeting ready <laughs> what review meeting <laughs> right it's ritual same laundry list same slides right and you don't like it i don't like it but we had to do it because it's review so what we found was we said hey how do we enhance the effectiveness of these meeting why are people just getting into a room and going through the same slide month over month quarter over quarter year over year right so we said can we actually help the leader or the reviewer to focus on the behavioral aspects of the team because you are anyway taking care of the operational aspects right for example what does, what gets discussed in any review meeting why is this not done why is there a delay here when do we expect to complete this we are delayed here so what uh, additional resources do we, standard right so if we are we are kind of slow here how do we make up for it how do we compensate for it typical so we said how do we help the leader or the manager to focus on the behavioral aspects in addition to the operational aspects so what the system will do is let's say that i'm just giving you a random example right so let's say that <coughs> we are going to have a review meeting <coughs> sorry with all the with all the faculty right so let's say shinu and team is coming to you for a review okay so the moment you go and select the team what the system will do is it'll actually pop up areas that you need to focus on because that's where the group is weak 
Okay. So when you go and select a particular area, it will actually recommend some questions for you to bring up during your review. Okay. Let me give you a simple example. I know that this team, as we saw, is low on influence. Correct. So what's the kind of questions that I will ask when this team comes to me for review? Hey, you want something from him? Did you get it? I know that you wouldn't have pushed him. That is the kind of question I should ask, not go through some 10 slides. Right? Because that is exactly where the group is have, going to have problems. Right? Or, for example, typically when you're working in teams, there is so much of dependency, right? When you do an MPP, correct? You, you say that this activity is dependent on this activity, which in turn is dependent on that activity, and each activity has a different owner. You have a task owner or an activity owner, right? Now, if all these guys are unassertive, what will happen? Things won't move. Okay? So, I know that I'm dealing with a team where the team members are not assertive enough. They are not influential enough. So, what should I do? I should actually focus on that area. Or in, in this case, oh, wow, okay, Shinu should be here. Shinu would be very happy to see this and she agrees. Uh, I will say that even after she comes so that my conviction is high. Okay, It's not that else. So, in fact, when we were going through Shinu's report, I told Shinu that your empowerment is very low. Right? You are like, take this bottle, walk four steps, keep it here, don't turn back, go there. So, when you are not empowering people, they will not grow. Correct? So, Shinu's individual report also reflects this. Shinu is also part of the faculty group. Okay? Now, this group is low on empowerment. So, when assume a scenario where Shinu and team is coming to me for a review. What will I tell Shinu? Shinu, please give this task to this person and don't interfere. Because Shinu is micromanaging. Shinu will tell you what to do, exactly how to do. Shinu will also give you five steps and also tell you, give me a, send me a message after you complete these five steps. Which means what? Over a period of time, you are, you will, you will stop using your head. Right? When you, when you have a team like that, there's only one person who's actually calling the shots. So now I know how to deal with such people. Okay. That's the objective here. So you can actually go through the different scenarios there and I mean different areas. So for each area, you have a set of questions that will actually help you to deal with the problem areas of your team. Um, okay. So this is another feature that we have built. So what you can do here is if you have multiple teams in your organization, obviously you, you can actually compare any two teams to identify opportunities for knowledge sharing. This again is based on our research. What we found is that in most of the organizations, right, be it functional teams, be it project teams, over a period of time what happens is every team is actually busy achieving their own objectives, their own goals. So in some sense, unconsciously they start working in silos. I mean, if you are an ops team, you are busy with your own goals, right? If you are an HR team, if you are an L&D team, whatever it is. Now we said, how do we encourage these teams to learn from each other? How do we encourage these teams to collaborate with each other and leverage each other's strengths? So when you, when you, when you select two teams here, what actually it is telling you is, what are the areas where team A can actually help team B? Now, as HR, when you go to a particular project team or when you go to a particular development sector or when you go to a particular group, you see that this group is very, very enthusiastic, right? You see that. But when you go to another group, you see that they're all silent. Nobody even talks to each other. So as HR, can you actually help them to share their best practices with each other, right? So can you identify the best practices and then help them to kind of share that with each other so that they learn from each other and their synergy also goes up? That's the objective with which we have built this. Okay. Now, this is probably uh, one of the best features that we have built. Again, what we found was, now all of you, I'm sure, are part of recruitment, right? I mean, HR, one of the things that you do is you're completely or partially, directly or indirectly involved in talent acquisition. So what are the things that are focused or what are the things that you concentrate on when you're hiring someone? Functional expertise, yeah, technical expertise, domain expertise, right? Now, what we found was that whenever I'm making a decision to hire somebody, I'm not able to predict how well this person will fit into my team. That's where my intuition is coming in. That's why if you remember a lot of people, I mean, not if you remember, if you people know, a lot of people would have said, hey, I want you to talk to that person and give me your views. Why do you do that? A lot of people do that, right? That final round is typically, you know what? I find that this guy is technically very competent, 
functionally good, has the domain expertise, but can you have a quick chat with this person and tell me if you're okay? That's because that's the intuition part. That's the intuition part. Absolutely. So what we're doing here is we are saying now one behavior assessment will actually tell you who that person is as an individual. Correct? Now what we are doing here is we are taking the behavioral assessment of that individual, right? Taking the group profile and superimposing it, right? So, so one level, one level of one level of assessment is now I want to recruit this person. I will probably administer some assessment, look at the report, and then figure out right whether it's a go no go. What we are actually talking about is if you are recruiting that person for a specific team, can you see how well this person fits into that team? Not just understand or analyze that person as an individual. So that's the feature we have built here. Okay, so I'll just I'll just show you how it works. So uh, what I'll do is I'll... now let's say that you have this team of eleven people, and let's assume that Shino is joining your team. Okay, we have shortlisted Shino, so she's going to be joining you. Okay, so what I want to find out is how well does Shino fit into your team? Okay, now. What we are doing here in the back end is, like I said, there are 30 attributes. So the group has been assessed on these 30 attributes and Shinu has also been assessed on these 30 attributes. So what we are actually doing is we are comparing Shinu's profile with your group profile and then seeing where is a match, where is a mismatch. Based on that, we are saying, what is the level of fitment? Okay. Now, in addition to that, as you can see, it will also tell you what are the areas where Shinu will make a positive impact on this team? What are the areas where Shinu will make a negative impact on this team? I told you she's low on, low on empowerment, right? So, and what are the common strengths between Shinu and the team? Similarly, what are the common concerns between the team and the team and Shinu? Now, see this. I'm actually adding to the group miseries, to the group's miseries, because all of you are micromanaging. Shinu is also micromanaging. Right? So, see, today what is happening is I don't know the impact of putting a person into a team. I don't know. And what I would do here is Today, if you see, most of the uh, interview processes or hiring processes are not fine-tuned for compensating for a group's weak areas. Now, let's say that I'm managing a team of 20 people, 25 people. If I know that planning is one of my group's weaknesses, can I actually get somebody who's better at planning, right? That's how I'm actually kind of going to compensate for my team's weakness. So ideally, if empowerment is here, Shino should actually, I mean, Empower, empowerment should be here, which means what? Shinu is more empowering than the group. Now, this is a scenario where the group is less empowering, Shinu is also less empowering. So, typically what happens is, these are the kind of analysis that you can do before you kind of get somebody on board. Now, we also have an interesting, this is your leadership effectiveness. Now, this meter here says, how well Shinu fits into this team as a team member. And this says how well Shinu fits into this team as a team leader. As you can see, the fitment is very good, both as a team member and a team leader. Okay. Now, uh, how many of you have heard of Saskin? So recently, we we worked with Saskin. So there is something very interesting that happened there. So about 350 of their engineers across uh, three project teams went through this process, and uh, each of them had a delivery head who reported to the global delivery head. And uh, so after they went through the process, I kind of compiled their dashboard like this. And when I found that, I told you that there were three teams and there were three delivery heads. I found that the leadership index was ineffective or was low for all the three leaders. Okay, I was I was really taken aback because the next day I had to present that to the global delivery head. And how will I go and tell him all your three leaders are low on leadership index, right? Then I said because that's what the data is saying. So uh, we went. So his name is uh, Krishna Kumar. Uh, he reports directly to the CEO. Of Saskin. So I went and I said, boss, looks like all the three leaders that are reporting to you are low on leadership index. Right? And he said, you're spot on. He said the teams have been working not because of the leadership, but despite the leadership. They're all in an autopilot mode. They have been in the company, they have been with this customer for four years, five years, so they know what to do. Okay. So what we are doing here is now today what happens is if you look at anybody from operations, they would have made a decision, right? But like I said, they would have made a decision based on hunch. How do you kind of help them to reinforce that with data, right? So, so immediately what he did was uh, apparently they were actually looking at getting somebody from within the team to actually replace the delivery head. So they said, hey, why didn't you put that guy's name there? 
and then see if that guy is a better fit. So we put his name and he came across as a, a very good leader. So what is happening is that now there are so many decisions that are actually based on intuition and hunch. So can we kind of reinforce that with data? So that's another uh, attempt, right? Okay, so uh, what I have done here is I have mapped a few competencies because uh, some random competencies that we had for other companies. Uh, so this again is a very interesting thing. So how many of you are responsible for competency assessment and competency development in your company? Nobody is responsible, okay. Do you work with somebody who is responsible for co competency assessment, competency development? So what is the process? Standard competency. So how do you assess somebody on a particular competency? Okay. So how do you identify where exactly the person needs to be trained to build that competency to the next level? So what are some of the competencies you have? I mean, if you could name one or two, please. Sorry? Okay. That's a competency. Okay. That's a very interesting. So uh, you rate somebody on communication skills. Okay. So let's say that I got a three on communication skills. So what will you train me on and how will you train me? Now what we observed again based on uh, the research that we have been doing is when people talk about competencies, they are talking about it at a 50,000 feet level. Now communication skills is a 50,000 feet level. What goes into communication skills? When you say, so writing, listening, bring it down further. Okay. So there are two layers, right? So one is basically you can say reading, writing, what I was speaking, you bring it down further. Now, for example, if I say the right thing at the wrong time, that's also poor communication, right? You, you'll be, people will tell you you're out of context. If you, if you want to look at how good a, a person is in negotiations, right? Context becomes very important. So what we kind of are telling organizations is that you have to be able to break down a competency into behavioral aspects, right? If you really want somebody to understand where they're weak and improve, unless you break it down into behavioral aspects, it's not going to happen. Again, writing, my God, that's an old, how do you define writing? Reading, how do you define reading? So what happens is when you're at a very, very high level, it becomes very difficult for people to understand where exactly they're weak, what exactly they need to focus on. And when they're not clear on what exactly they need to focus on, definitely helping them get to the next level becomes a challenge. So one of the things that we have been, again, a lot of people, and in, in if you look at organizations, there is so much of money that gets invested in leadership programs, right? All of us send our leaders and everybody will go through the same leadership program. Are we saying that we all these leaders are lacking in all leadership traits? That's not possible, right? See, if you are a leader, I'm a leader. There are two traits that you're lacking in. There are two other traits that I'm lacking in. Why should both of us go through the same five-day leadership program? For example, in, in this case, I would put, if all of you were leaders, I would put all of you through an influence program. How to influence others? Isn't it? Why should I send you to a five? So what we found out was, instead of, you know, looking at a competency at a 50,000 feet level, if you can actually break it down into behavioral aspects that are easy to understand, then the assessment and the development becomes much focused and much faster. Okay. So for example, what I have done here is in the back end, if you see, I'll just show you how this mapping has been done. Um, so for example, if you take a particular competency, right? Let's say I take, I take uh, one of them. Let's say I take integrity as a. Well. So for example, even, even values, right? So today, if you look at organizations, most of the organizational values are relegated to boardroom wall hangings. Any organization you walk into in, in their meeting rooms, their vision, their values will be there. You go and ask all the employees, what are your values? You'll be surprised that many of them will not be able to list all the seven values. If they have more than three, I will take a bet that they'll not be able to list all the, all the, all the five values. I have done this. Forget other people, even the HR will not be able to repeat. I'm sorry to say this. No, I'm serious. And you're expecting the whole organization to demonstrate those values in everything they do. How will that happen? Correct? 
So what we do here is, let's say you, again, integrity. This again is a very cliched value, right? All of us would have joined, uh, worked in a company where integrity is one of the core values, correct? Now, how do you measure integrity? How will I know whether all the employees in my organization are demonstrating this value? How will I know? So what we do there is, we break it down into demonstrable behavior, right? So for example, what, what goes into integrity? Now we are saying, if you are a person who walks a talk, you are demonstrating this value. Or if you are a person who are able to back up whatever you say with data, you are demonstrating integrity. If you are a person who will stand by whatever statements or opinions you make, you are demonstrating integrity. If you are a person who speaks up, that's also integrity, right? I mean, if I'm if I'm keeping quiet and I see things that are not the right things to do, and if I don't open up and speak, that's again loss of integrity. So what we're doing here is we are breaking down an organizational competency or an organization value into demonstrable behavior so that it becomes easy for you to identify where exactly an individual or an organization is low and then help them in those areas. So this is what we do in the back end and what, what, what you are seeing here is an output of this. So what I have done is I have assigned some competencies here. Now let us go back to your group. And let us say innovation. Where does this group stand when it comes to innovation? So your rating is 7.87. That is your current score. That is your innovation score. Like I said, this is of the entire group, not individuals. Now, what are the two things that I am seeing here? These are the improvement areas. If this group needs to build their innovation to the next level or if you want this group to be more innovative, then these are the two areas that need, they need to focus on. First of all, they need to be more aspirational, right? You should have the desire to excel. Second is, you should also have the ability or develop the ability to achieve more with less. You, you have to be able to optimize your resources, right? And then it is also telling you who within this group is good in these two areas. For example, who is good at optimization? Madhu and Priyanka, right? And then who is good at aspiration? Gaurav and Teresa. Now, if you go and look at, let us say, another, let us say, respect. So, what we are trying to do is, we are trying to quantify how well a particular group is demonstrating an organizational value which, which does not happen. Okay. So, for example, my score for respect is 7.92. This is where the group is when it comes to this particular value. And then, these are the two areas where the group needs to improve and these are the guys who are good there. So that's that's how we do the mapping. Okay, so I think uh, this is one last feature. So what we have done here is again uh, there is a very interesting. Uh, I would recommend that you look up this uh, survey by IBM uh, that was done in 2016 on uh, the impact of trainings that happen across the world. Right. So uh, let's see if I can put it up on the group. I have a PDF with me, so I'll post it on the group. So. What that IBM research found was that in top performing companies, 86% of the employees got the trainings they need. And in bottom performing companies, only 16% of the employees got the trainings they need. So what the report actually says is that in most organizations, trainings are not effective, not because of the curriculum, not because of the trainer, because of inaccurate training need analysis. In most organizations, training is a top down approach. Some L&D head. Any L and D heads here? Okay, or uh, no offense, right? So some L and D heads, some university. Uh, I mean, big organizations will have a university, right? Like Intel University, Oracle University, right? So you kind of come up with a training calendar for the whole year. After that, you are pestering managers to nominate people for the training, and who gets nominated? Whoever is free, <laughs> right? And then you say that the training was not effective. So what it says is that. Uh, up to about 60 to 70 percent of the training budget is wasted because it is not need based. Okay. So, what we were trying to, the way we were trying to address that is we are saying, okay, now if you actually get the employees to do a 360 degree feedback, right, and if you take the feedback from all the people that the employee is working with, for example, if my, my manager is saying I am weak in planning. If my direct reports are saying I'm weak in planning, if my customers, my vendors, if everyone is saying that I'm weak in planning, there is a very high probability that I need to be trained in planning, right? So rather than figuring out, okay, now I think this 
so it, it's it's more like in fact uh, the the funny part of the report is that it's it's become more like flavor of the year the flavor of this year is you pick a few topics correct typically and you want some uh, some new buzzwords some catchy things right so you you see which ones they are and you try to you know, roll out training programs in that particular area so if it's not need based there is no way you'll be able to do justice to your training budget okay so what we have done here is uh, what i'm doing here is at the group level so i'm looking at a group of 11 people and these are the 30 attributes that we measure as part of the assessment right so all of you went through the assessment so these are the 30 attributes grouped into five orientations now these numbers indicate how many people in this group have that particular area as your bottom five scores right which means what the highest number is your topmost priority now you are looking at a group of 11 people right what it says is expression is where all 11 of you need to be trained because it's part of your bottom five scores which one is the next one probably influence seven out of 11 have influence as part of your bottom five scores so now what we're trying to do is this is a need based training because all the people who are working with this group are saying that these are the areas where the group seems to be weak right now you can actually drill down and look at uh, is it okay if i show individual names okay with everyone everyone so what we have done here is although we are saying seven people are weak in planning we have just taken the bottom 20 percent okay so because it's 11 people team you're only showing two names here okay so don't worry uh, other names will also show up so it's not like oh, oh i'm not here okay so let's make sure that all the names show up so that nobody gets left behind or whatever right did, did you see all the other names yeah okay Hello? if you didn't see we can go to other so there are enough don't worry just just tell me if you didn't see a name i'll make sure you see that name you never know i mean there might be somebody who might not be in the bottom 20 percent of any of these names don't feel bad if your name is repeating it's okay all of us need to improve so, so what we are actually doing here is we are seeing in each attribute oh, sorry what yeah, yeah you can tell me no problem your name is not there anywhere great excellent all right good <laughs> okay so so when you when you select a particular area what is that no no your name is not <laughs> you don't fall into the bottom two you whom did you, you must have invited uh, your uh, friends family so typically the dashboard we don't bring in the personal listen because yeah uh, we don't we don't bring, we, we go by the category that you have invited we don't bring that in because that will lead to all kinds of problems and we, we keep usually the personal feedback outside okay so so what it's actually saying is when you when you select a particular area it's actually telling you who are the people who need to be trained in that particular area it will also tell you what is their recommended mode of learning. So, for example, today another approach that we have is, okay, leadership training, put everybody through a classroom, into a classroom for five days. For all you know, 50% of them are dozing off. For example, if you put me in a classroom like this, I will not be awake for more than two hours. I can't. I can't sit and listen to a lecture or I can't sit and listen to a presentation. So, do you actually know what is the preferred mode of learning of each individual? If you really want to do justice to your training budget, you need to be aware and you need to factor in all these aspects. Otherwise, you are saying, okay, let's sign up for some online program and put the whole 10,000 people through online program. For all you know, 5,000 of them just hate online programs. Right? So, what it's also telling you is, they have three recommendations. Uh, is it exploration? Is it experience? Is it education? This one. Huh. Yeah, yeah. See, what I'm actually saying is, so for example, uh, let me navigate back. So this was the initial screen. So I want to know, okay, out of these 11 people here, right, 
what it's saying is seven people have this particular area as their bottom five. Now, if I want to know who are the people who need to be trained in this particular area, now these two are the people who form the bottom 20% of this group. Okay. Yeah, it's the bottom 20%. So it's an 11 member team. Bottom 20 would be up. This is the bottom 20% of this group. Right. So what we are saying is these are the two people who need to be trained in this particular area. This is the recommended mode of learning for them. Okay. So there are, there are three options that we have. Is it education, which means uh, do you prefer a classroom kind of a program? Okay. Or is it exploration? Is it something that you would like to learn online? Or is it experience? Do you li like a hands-on kind of a program? Okay. And then finally, we are also recommending some peer mentors. So one of the things that, so one of the things that we find in organizations is that organizations are not making the best use of their in-house potential. Correct. So for example, I mean, uh, in a team of 12 people here, if one of you is weak in planning, out of the remaining 11, there's definitely one other person who's good at planning. Otherwise, there's nothing, you wouldn't have done even a single assignment, despite Shinu's uh, constant reminders and, right? Shinu's back. Shinu, I think there is one thing that I would like to show you. Okay, we, we put your profile on one side and then see, and then saw how you would fit into this team as a leader. <laughs> Yeah, so 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 they saw that. You know what? They are also Hitlers. As a group, as a group. Yeah, neo neo Nazi, right? So, and then finally, what we are saying is, you know, you can actually go and so that person is actually uh, good here. So this recommendation it is not just based on the scores. So it is not like my planning is low and his planning is uh, high, and he is being recommended as a peer coach to me. What the system does is. It will go and look at what is my learning style and what is his mentoring style or what is his nurturing style. And only if there is a match, it will recommend somebody as a peer coach for me, not otherwise. Not just because somebody's score is higher than mine, that person gets uh, recommended as a mentor to me. Okay. And, and finally, there is this feature called virtual teams. So uh, again, what we have done here is the predictive analytics part. So again, if you look at when you're putting a team together, okay. Now, how do you make sure that you get the right mix, right? Or how do you make sure that you get the optimal mix? Now, definitely, let's say that you're building a software development team. You know that you need four developers, you need two testers, you need one UI designer, you need one documentation specialist, you need one uh, architect, you need one project manager. We are not talking about the technical competencies or the functional competencies, right? We are talking about the behavioral competencies. Now, we're saying, when you put a team together, how will they perform? So individually, you know that this person is a good program manager. You know that this person is a good developer. This person is a good tester, so on. But when you put them in a team, what is likely to happen? Okay. So that's what you're going to do here. Now, let, let's, let's just create a team uh, here randomly. So what I've actually done is I've actually created what we call a virtual team. Okay. Now that team is available for your analysis here. This is what we call a virtual team. So now what I do is I can actually go and look at the squad of this team. I can look at what are the strengths of this team, what are the weaknesses of this team, what are the areas where this group is likely to overdo things, right? See empowerment, right? So you can actually go and look at, uh, you know, uh, where does this team stand when it comes to different organization values or when it comes to organization competencies. You can actually go and look at the learning need analysis. So if you're not happy with what you're seeing, you can actually go back and reconfigure the team. So if you have the luxury of resources, I mean, we are talking about uh, an organization scenario. So if you're putting a new project team together and if you have 20 people to choose from and you're creating a five people team, you put five people and you don't see what you want. You can actually move a few people out, get a few people in. So this is what typically when you, if you look at any business intelligence or a business analytics tool, what it actually gives you is a what if analysis. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a default, right? So you can actually create mock scenarios and try to predict the possible outcomes. So we have tried to replicate the same thing when it comes to team formation here, because what we have found is that today what happens is you put a team together, you put a manager there, and by the time the manager figures out what kind of a team he or she has been given, the damage is done, right? So we are saying, can we be proactive there? Can we try to predict what is likely to go wrong with this team or what would be the best way to manage this team so that the leader or the manager is better prepared to manage the team and get the best out of them, okay? That's the objective with which we have. So that's about it. Any questions? Yeah. 
I will, I will, I will put that up on the. So, for example, let me let me just share one of the things that we uh, do, right? I mean, uh, okay, I will let me let me take this. I will I will tell you how this. I will tell you how how let's say. Um, see what we actually see. That's why uh, what we do is there are there are quite a few checks and balances that we put in place. So, for example, we uh, the the outliers are flagged. So, for example, if uh, somebody gave me like a nine on more than fifteen questions, I mean, we have like a whole lot of rules in the back end. So, it'll kind of flag that for review. It'll not straight away reject that particular response, but it'll flag it for review, right? Yeah. So, when you're building a questionnaire, okay, uh, that's for, that's one, and and definitely, I mean, you'll find a whole lot of material on how do you on how you go about building a an assessment questionnaire. But some of the things is you kind of also bring in some negative questions, so people just don't monotonously, you know. Just slide the slider, or you know, just they would have. So, so for example, the the Cronbach's alpha is a measure of how consistently a question is being read and interpreted the way it needs to be. So we do that. So for example, uh, so we do a lot of statistical uh, analysis in the back end, right? So for example, we do this explanatory factor analysis. We do confirmation factor. For example, you might say, uh, like for example, you're saying. Why is it that you have put these seven attributes into this orientation? So that's been logically, yeah, we know it fits there. But statistically, also we have proven that it fits there, right? Right? Yeah. So I will. If if I don't get it here, I will put it up on the. I will I will I will give you the uh, logic uh, for how how one of the features works in the backend. So fine. So I I took them through the analytics. Uh, so they were pretty happy with what they saw, right? So uh, report. Uh, I'll walk them through the report. Uh, so uh, any other questions on this? If you have any questions, uh, otherwise we can just I'll quickly walk you through the report. Okay. Doctor Shino, one of the things that I was telling them is the group is good at understanding. They they are they have this inclination to kind of dive deeper and understand, but their inclination to apply is very low. So that's something that I told all of them. Uh, so so I told them if you went through this whatever eight week ten week program, went back and continued to do whatever you're doing, there's no point. You have to look for opportunities to apply what you've learned. Uh, first thing. Second thing is initiative. No, it is no, it's not an initiative. No, no, it's not a failure because understanding is high. Actually, actually, I told them, I told them you can actually be professors in Reva. No, no, immediately you can apply and you can get into. It. Oh, I thought Reva University. Okay. <laughs> the next batch is ready, so you Shinu will need some help. So if you are good at uh, understanding, then yeah. So yeah. So you can you can. Oh okay. Yeah. See, analytics is all about doing. It's not about knowing. Analytics is like mathematics, right? It's like you can't say I I know how to solve this problem. It's like okay, you solve the problem, right? And you also have to kind of uh, see uh, see one of the uh, I mean uh, no offense, but honestly, over the last one year, we have been pitching to at least uh, I think we would have pitched to at least about 150 uh, CHROs at least, uh, right from uh, people managing the HR function in a you know in a in a startup. For example, we work we work with Axel. Axel Partners. Uh, Axel has invested in close to about 150 companies in India, close to about one billion dollar investments. So we work with somebody who kind of takes care of the HR function for a 20 people startup, all the way up to somebody who heads HR for a company that's as big as 50,000 people, 60,000 people. One of the things that uh, we noticed is that somewhere the HR or the LND seems to be a little hesitant. They don't seem to be data savvy. 
somewhere they they either they either think that it's not uh, their cup of tea or they get intimidated okay so unless you apply that intimidation will stay see you have to build a case you have to build a case see for anything right so for example is is your company is your company sponsoring this or you it's a company sponsor? how did you convince a company to sponsor you you build a case right you build a case or you 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 give a self approval ha ah. ah, okay absolutely so so they have to go and build a case right so now you can say that i have attended this program and i want to show the value right so whatever you have invested so what is roi absolutely so you you build a case you build a case for that yeah it's a mobile but what you are saying is only 10 people have a system so you don't have to go and assess everyone right so you look at who what is that 20% of the organization that's making an impact maybe the top two layers top three layers you can start with that you can start with that right so i mean it's like if you want to do you have to build a case and and also tell people what is it that you are going to give them right i mean you have to uh, you know sign up for some kind of an outcome right because analytics is all about outcome right you can't say you know what i learned it so i want to do something say yeah yeah good you can go out and do a project <laughs> right so you can say that this is what i'm going to do and this is why i'm going to do it and this is what i'm going to give you as an output right and if that's compelling enough i don't see a reason why uh, an organization would not want to sign up for it what i would do is either that or go and look at what are some of the people issues in your organization what is your organization struggling with and see if you can solve that using any of whatever you've learned here so that's why see if you you have to go and look at how do you integrate your learning right isn't it otherwise what will happen is that's what i was telling them that your learning will be in one compartment and whatever you're doing on a daily basis will be in another compartment they'll be like parallel tracks they'll never absolutely <laughs> yeah absolutely so maybe you should do that you should go and look at so what are the top three people challenges in your organization or with the managers and then see how we can uh, solve the challenges using an approach like this so then build a case around that once you identify the problem see because nobody would want to give you a chance to implement a project right so the moment you go to them and say hey i know that this is your pain point and i want to solve this for you they will listen to you they'll they'll at least start listening to you Alright, so so I'll quickly walk you through this report. Uh, the first couple of pages are introductory. Okay, it talks about what is the assessment, what are the five orientations it measures. So as I was telling you, the thirty attributes that we measure as part of the assessment, they are grouped into these five orientations. Okay, that's your ability to achieve results, your ability to build relationships, your ability to influence people and events, your ability to learn and apply what you learn. your ability to share feedback or share opinions and nurture others and then it says what's a 360 degree report and one thing that i would encourage all of you to do is go and look at how many areas you have overrated yourself how many areas you have underrated yourself how many areas your ratings are almost on par with the ratings given by others if you have overrated yourself in too many areas what that means is that you think you are a rock star but nobody seems to agree with you which is not a good scenario right you think you're superman superwoman whatever it is but people are saying boss you're also like us okay that's a bad scenario because the i'm i'm saying that's bad because your own orientation to learn and grow would be low because you think that you've already arrived okay so if you're overrated yourself in too many areas uh, please take a step back and do a realistic assessment of your own abilities if you if you have under if you have under uh, rated yourself in way too many areas when i say too many areas we have 30 areas uh, totally all together if you have if it's more than 15 which is more than 50% if you have underrated yourself in more than 50% of the areas 
what that actually means is you are a person who has the desire to learn and grow but on the flip side you also lack faith or confidence in your own abilities because everybody is saying that you know what you're good but you think you know what i don't think i'm good enough okay so it means that you have this inclination to learn more you have this inclination to grow but at the same time under pressure especially you have you start doubting your own capabilities okay and and if any of you have more than 15 within range it means that your your level of self awareness is pretty high which means whether you are doing anything about it or not you are aware of your weaknesses that's what it means okay if if more than 50 15 areas have within range this double headed green arrow okay so that's something that you might probably want to do across orientations and kind of take account of uh, and then uh, the 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 entire assessment is built on the concept of imbalances okay uh what does that mean a high score on a particular attribute does not mean anything to the report in general let me give you a simple example let's say that uh, i ask all of you to rate me on aspiration i'm just giving you a random example and all of you give me a 9 let's assume that we have been working with each other for quite some time and you know me fairly well and i ask you to rate me on my ability to generate ideas my ability to dream big so you say that a hey, prabhat is always talking ideas so i think this person has a lot of aspiration so you give me a 9 assume that all of you give me a 9 now the system does not interpret that score for you now that's what we call a unidimensional approach right i'm not looking at how an individual has been rated on a particular dimension now imbalances is where it will actually go and look at how prabhat is rated on let's say ownership which is prabhat's ability to convert his ideas into reality okay now you probably say that you know what prabhat is always talking ideas uh, 6 months ago he something even today is saying the same thing which means he is all talk no action right so you give me a seven what the system does is it will call this a value imbalance which means prabhat is more oriented towards a particular value which is aspiration and less oriented towards another value which is ownership right because of which there is an imbalance and what is the implication of this imbalance prabhat is more of a dreamer than a doer talks a lot no action now that's what the entire assessment and the report is based on this concept of imbalances okay so if you got a 10 on something that does not mean anything to the assessment it will go and look at okay how have you scored on this and this and this it will actually go and look at what are the imbalances and tell you okay hey, these are the imbalances you have developed over the years and this is what you have to do to fix this imbalance and move to the next level okay so and then it also says so the third page is where your actual report starts so the first orientation that we measure is your achievement orientation which is your own ability to set goals and achieve results so there are there are six attributes here and what we are saying here is your ability to achieve results is based on the interplay among these six attributes okay now for each attribute you will see how you have rated yourself you will also see how others have rated you which is a simple average of the ratings given by all your respondents and then you also see a gap the gap is your score minus other score and in this case this person has actually underrated himself across all the six attributes that's what it means you see the downward arrows right and the range here the last column right you see a number there uh, a two decimal number that actually indicates what is the max minus min given to you by your respondents what i mean by that is if you invited five people to give you feedback one person give you a nine which is the highest and the other person give you a four <coughs> the range is 9 minus 4 now how does this matter to you let's say that you invited five colleagues and let's say that the range is 5 it means that somebody gave you somebody gave you 4 what you might probably want to look at there is how can you be perceived so drastically differently by the same set of people it's actually like it's like i have these five people that i work with this guy is saying hey prabhat is he wants to become the next ambani and she is saying prabhat is happy with the 5000 salary there is something wrong there right so you might probably want to kind of go and talk to people who gave you feedback and ask them hey i'm not going to beat you up right especially if it's a direct report you please tell me honestly what you gave me and why you gave me that okay because why are you being interpreted or why are you being perceived so drastically differently by the same set of people you work with okay that's something that might be of interest to you absolutely absolutely it's not different places so one of the things that uh, we do uh, i think in this case i don't know did all of you get multiple reports like a 360 degree report a collaborative report 
right? So what we do for that reason is we give you different reports. For example, there's one report that actually tells you how you've been rated by your manager. One report that tells you how you've been rated by your direct reports. So instead of taking a 360 and looking for something like this, you might probably want to take a category wise report. For example, take a report uh, based on the feedback given to you by your direct reports, right? Like seven people give you feedback. Now there, Definitely, why are you being different to all the direct reports? And that too so drastically differently. Same category, yeah. They're all direct reports or they're all colleagues, they're all vendors, they're all friends, they're all customers. Okay, so it makes more sense when you're actually looking at a category-wise report. 360 is where we roll up the feedback given by all categories of people. There it might not make sense. Yeah, obviously, your manager says something else, your direct reports say something else. That, that's there for sure. Okay, and then what you also see is, out of the six attributes, there is one attribute that's highlighted in red. So what we're saying is that based on the feedback given by your respondents, that's your low score. So if you want to enhance your ability to achieve results, that's the area that you need to work on. In this case, it's time sense in the sample report, right? And then what you see in the next section is an interpretation of all the imbalances. Like I was telling you, if my aspiration is high and my ownership is low, that's what we call an imbalance and that imbalance has a certain implication. That's what is explained in the next section. So you can actually go and read through all the imbalances. And the scores that you're seeing here, these are all the scores given to you by your respondents. These are not your self scores. Your self scores are used only to calculate your action perception gap. That is your scores minus other scores. But for analyzing your orientations and to give you interpretations imbalances, you are going by other scores. Right. So this is my second orientation. So this is my ability to build healthy relationships. So we are saying that your ability to build and sustain healthy relationships is based on the interplay among these five attributes. Again, here again, we do the same thing. How you have rated yourself, how others have rated you, what's the difference. And here again, you see that there is one area that's been called out as my improvement area, the one that's highlighted in red. So if I want to enhance my ability to build and uh, nurture healthy relationships, that's the area that I need to focus on or improve. In. Okay. So here again, you'll see the implications. So how many of you got anything other than expression as a low score here? Okay. No, uh, okay. Achievement, how many of you uh, got anything other than, um, there's no pattern here. So how, aspiration, anybody got low? Okay. Ownership? Optimization? Okay. Involvement? So, so optimization low, you are, you are people who will slog, right? You don't look for smarter ways, you should start looking at smarter ways, right? Okay. Uh, involvement low, please go into details, your eye for detail is low. You might end up losing a lot of time in rework. Are, okay, are, you should have done this instead of that. So, <laughs> right. Planning, yeah, I, I wouldn't expect any of you to be low here because it came up as an over, uh, this thing, uh, over skilled uh, area. <laughs> so, uh, they are, you know, all of you are maybe overdoing it. Uh, time sense. So time sense is basically whenever you are working on an idea or initiative, do you get do your time at work? Right. So I mean, do you analyze the context and then see is this the right time to do this, or you'll say uh, I know how to make it work? And uh, anybody? Okay. I'd be surprised if anybody got anything other than expression as a low score here. Like I was telling you, this is more a cultural thing, right? So we have seen this uh, pattern across. Asian countries. So most of us are low on expression. And then uh, the next is leadership orientation. So this is your ability to influence people at events. So here we are saying your ability to influence is based on the interplay among these seven attributes. So how many of you got influence low? Most of you should have got influence low because that's the group's low score. Empowerment also most of you should have got low. Yeah. So that's the so those whose influence is low, please make sure that people don't take you for a ride. If you have to speak up, speak up. Being, a, being assertive is not being authoritative. Please understand the difference. Okay, it's okay to be assertive. The problem is when you start becoming authoritative, right? And those who are uh, low on empowerment, please don't be authoritative. <laughs> okay, be more empowering, empower others, don't micromanage. Let people use their brains, okay? Don't think that, uh, you know, see sometimes what happens is, People who are low on empowerment are, are too scared of something not working. They don't want to take any chance. They are afraid of failure. 
so they will trust only themselves they will not trust anybody else right so please start trusting people they are also capable they are also skilled give them a chance maybe start small give them a small project even if they mess up it's okay and then okay credibility low this is a scary thing credibility credibility low okay uh, task involvement low people involvement yeah i think people involvement was one of your strengths so organized no no this also won't be a prioritization no also the problem is influence and empowerment you know what happens with this team if you if you remember we saw both influence and empowerment coming up as low scores right if you remember for the participants see if influence and empowerment is coming up as low scores it's a cash winded situation you are neither authoritative nor you are empowered you don't let people do what they want neither do you tell people what to do <laughs> okay in case of shinu she is very clear she is very, she will say boss do it that's all empowerment is low influence is also low it's a cash winded too so just imagine what happens in an organization scenario things don't move i will not speak up and tell people what what to do at the same time if they do something and say oh okay okay who told you you should have asked me right so that's a cash 22 so did do you see any cash 22 in this uh, dr shinu any cash 22 here things not moving not people not able to mix with each other not able to push each other it's like it's it's more like everybody will do what they want to do when they want to do it will be like that and nobody can change it right that's that's that it will be a stalemate right everybody nobody will uh, push anybody nobody will uh, you know drive anybody influence anybody everybody is will do i will do this only after the last date that's it no question was right okay yeah it's there no at the end of the report did you take up the assessment okay okay so that's the and then you have the learning so this i was telling them uh, you know that for the entire group like i said understanding came up as a as a strength as a common strength so i told them that they have this inclination to dive deeper and so so the way the way i i, I would i mean the way we would probably interpret that here is we don't kind of we don't stack rank any of these attributes we don't say this is better than that okay all that we are saying is every attribute is important you are more inclined towards this attribute than the other attributes so in in your case as you saw your your integration is low which means all of you understand but you don't apply and your initiative was also low right if you remember so again coming back to the same point how many of you will go back and google on assessment based analytics the answer is zero right so you will talk about it again when i am here you are here next time saturday till then forget it right and then finally you have your nurturing so nurturing orientation is your ability to share feedback it's your your ability to share opinions and nurture people around you okay so how many of you have outspokenness low here okay uh, in the in the previous section how many of you have understanding low integration low i should see a few names integration yeah integration should be high only two oh nahi nahi i'm saying this is when i say low the one that's high like lowest score i'm talking about this openness openness is low wow okay what happens what happens when openness is low ha huh? boss i know what you are saying boss okay you are teaching me right i know what will work okay okay i will i don't want to disappoint you i will listen okay no problem you, chalo jo bhi bolna hai bol ke jao that is low oh, low openness why you laughing means that's exactly the same as going on in your mind ha ha nahi nahi did you have openness like this low score ha ah. <coughs> range is 10 so in that case what we actually do is there is there see yes it may, if it's a negative question so that's what we do in the next level of analysis No, no. Don't worry about. Ha. Ah, okay. So that's why maybe somebody gave you a zero. That's why you got this. So what is it in your case? Eight point eight four. Eight 
range could be sometimes sometimes if it's a negative question no but do you have the thought whatever i told you <laughs> I thought I just said what was on your mind. No. <laughs> so now you should maybe what I would recommend is go back and talk to them, right? Because it's not good to have openness as a low score, right? Because it's harder to change than any other score. Yeah. So talk to them. I mean, you just have to take them into confidence and tell them that hey, I'm not questioning your scores. I'm only saying if anything went wrong. There's no harm. <clears throat> And finally, nurturing orientation. So, and then you have uh, this is where you have the IDP, right? You are asking for that. So, what we are saying here is, uh, in from five orientations, there are five low areas that have been called out. But what we are saying here is, don't be called five to open because you may not be able to do justice. So, talk to some people that you think are important, and then look at what is it that you want to achieve in the short term, which is eight to twelve months. So, and then pick only two areas to work on because. Why we say two areas is because if you see all these are behavioral dimensions, right? These these are not skills that you can pick up in two three months. Okay, so because these are all behavioral dimensions, it's hard to change that. It's so, so for example, let's say I'm a, I'm low on aspiration. I mean, in in a month from now, I can't uh, start dreaming of becoming Ambani, right? <laughs> my my orientation is I mean I'm I'm happy with whatever I'm doing. So it needs a lot of uh, you know dedication. It needs a lot of focus for you to change any of your behavioral uh, attitudes. So that's what we are saying here. But what you also have is a small set of action items for each of your low areas. Like I said, those are just some uh, action items for you to get started. And then finally, what what we have also done is we have see what we have done is we have we have brought in the analogy of a wheel to help you understand how these imbalances are affecting you. Okay. So if if you were to plot all the attributes in the form of a wheel. This is the kind of wheel that I have. So, with this wheel, will you have a smooth ride? Is the question, right? No, no. I mean, all of us will have. I mean, definitely. So, so definitely, all of us don't want to have a wheel like this because our journey is not going to be smooth. Our ride is not going to be smooth, right? So, what we have done here is, if you remember from uh, what you saw during analytics, we have grouped those thirty attributes into three areas. This is the wheel. So, we are saying that this wheel is affecting your execution capabilities, and then. If you go next, what we are saying here is so we are saying all of us want to grow outward, right? We want a bigger wheel, we want a smoother wheel. So the first step for you, and this is what we say is part of your long-term development, right? I mean, you can't uh, improve in thirty behavioral dimensions in like a year or two, right? It's like it's like reinventing yourself. So we are saying it's a long-term plan, three years, five years, whatever it is. And then this is on the lighter side, we are saying if you want a If you want a smooth wheel, you can chop off all the extra pieces, right? And then you'll get a small, nice wheel, smooth wheel, right? We do that, don't we? I mean, it 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 sounds a little stupid, it sounds a little funny, but unconsciously we might chop off our wheels. Let's say that I'm a person who has a lot of aspiration, okay? But I'm not willing to work hard for that. What will I do? I'll stop dreaming. I will only keep talking ideas to everybody. Everybody will feel will feel happy, clap, and then nothing will. That's what is called shrinking your wheel, right? Unconsciously, we are doing it. Okay, it is just that you are not able, you are not pushing yourself beyond a particular limit. You are not living your potential. Okay, and then, like I said, these seven attributes are what we call the hub that holds all these spokes, fifteen spokes together. So these attributes indicate what is your extent of involvement or what is your extent of engagement in whatever you do. It could be in your task, it could be uh, in your relationships, it could be uh, in your learning. Okay, so these attributes or these parameters tell you what is your extent of engagement or involvement. Finally, you have these. Uh, so again, going back to the analogy of a wheel, all of you have. Uh, do all of you know that there is something called a cotter pin that holds the spokes and the hub together? I, I know I'm getting too mechanical, but right. So if you actually look at the composition of a wheel, there are spokes, there is a hub, and there is a cotter pin that holds the spokes and the hub together. So we have tried to bring in that analogy to help you understand these thirty attributes. So the caught up in is like the uh, like the discipline aspect, right? What is your ability to plan, and also what is your ability to time your actions? Okay. Typically, typically what typically what we recommend is work on the short term now. Mm. So that will uh, be there in the group analytics, no? 
in the group you also have a feature called lnd which will tell you what are the learning needs across these 30 attributes for example it will tell you how many people have this area in their bottom five and so on so based on that they can design their training needs hmm? we'll say we'll say pick the top three no see for example you're looking at 11 member team okay we are saying Expression is where all the 11 people have that as part of their bottom five. So obviously that's immediate training. So what is the next biggest number? So you look at this. You can say that, okay, this quarter we'll focus on these two or this. Absolutely. So 12, we say that the validity or a shelf life of the data is 12 months. After that, we recommend a reprofile. <coughs> all right. So any questions? This, what we are saying is, this is your highest score. Where are the other scores in relation to that score? That's what we are saying. We are indicating what is the lag or what is the delta between your low scores and your highest score. It's just a visual indication. Which, so what you are actually saying is, first of all, see, this is your lowest, right? So you build it to this level first. See, we are talking about the wholesomeness. So we are not saying, see typically, I mean, uh, I don't know if I should, it would be appropriate to bring this up. If you look at the uh, Western uh, way of uh, development, right, they talk about specialization. For example, uh, if you're a strategist, we want you to do strategy. We, we don't want you to do anything else. If you're a planner, we want you to be a planner. So if you look at the Eastern philosophy, right, we talk about wholesomeness. So the reason why we talk about wholesomeness is because in, in the case of the Western model, one plus one will never be more than two. Let me give you a simple example. Let's say that I'm I'm weak in planning. Okay, you have to remind me every day, correct, to do something that I'm supposed to do. Now your time and energy is being wasted. If I become a better planner, your time is spent in something more useful. Okay. So that's why West believes in specialization, and we believe in what we call Purnam. Right? That's the reason why we use that wheel. Look okay, at holistic. Ideally. Typically, the West will say, if you look at a strength finder, right, they'll say this is your strength, play by your strength. So, that you'll do anyway. <laughs> Why wouldn't you do it, right? <laughs> ah. The highest score in each orientation is your strength. If you look at every orientation, do it orientation wise. If you want to, if you want to understand what is your strong area, do it at an orientation level. Because that is, for example, if you look at achievement orientation, that's your ability to achieve results. There, your highest score will be your strength in achieving results. Your lowest score would be that's what is hampering your ability to achieve results. No, that is that that model is for the group. We are actually building something similar for individuals also, but at this point of time, that's meant for groups. Any other questions? So, if there is anybody who has not uh, still completed your report, I will, I mean, uh, completed your assessment, I will extend it further. I will send it to him. Give, just give me his email ID. Priyanka, is it? Oh, okay. You, you have done it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah I see. Oh, okay. Actually, I can do that right away so that I don't forget. You didn't do it seriously. Yeah. In your case, you did it. That itself is a great thing. <laughs> forget doing it seriously. Huh? We extended, you asked Dr. Yoshino, we extended it four times. <laughs> that's why I said you did it. That's a great thing. <laughs> mm. What's your openness score? <laughs> no.
Um, so, sorry, uh, Preeti, is it? Who else? This one. Shukumara. Huh? And Kumar Bhaskar also. How do you, W-I-N is it? Anybody else? What? I, I, I'm extending it. I'm doing it. <laughs> One sec. Let me just. Uh... So all of you uh, have not submitted it, right? The four of you? Let me just, one second. I'm only those who want an extension, I'm doing it now. Those who want to unsubmit will do it later. I mean, after this. So I, I will extend it by, it doesn't make sense. One day, half a day, two hours, doesn't make sense. Because again, this group time for learning is low, right? So I would extend it by, had I seen this course, usually when you say extend, I would have extended by two weeks, right? I will extend it by 15 days or whatever, right? <laughs> Okay, now who has submitted but wants to kind of take it back and yeah. oh, that's a back end. We can't do it. I mean, we don't. We can't do it through the interface. Uh, yeah. So, who, please, huh? The names who who wants. Gitanjali. Anybody else? Gitanjali, Ramya, Mamta. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. It's like it's like unfreeze. You will continue from where you left off. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, no, no. Do it seriously. That's all. That's the only thing I'll tell you. <laughs> no other guideline. Do it seriously. Which? You do one thing. What did you invite them as? Now invite them under some other category, no? So that we, you just get that report. What I'm saying is. Hmm. I can't go delete. See, once. So once somebody has done the thing, I can't go delete it, right? Because that no, no, that doesn't make sense. We should not have such options because people will not trust the system. I can't just go delete what you gave me, right? I mean, what's the point? So we don't even have those features. Hmm. You can invite more people or if so. <laughs> but you can do it yourself. Or even you do your self-assessment. You didn't do it. Uh, don't worry about it. No, no, no. Don't do that. Don't have that. Hey, uh, I mean, so if if you see a gap between your scores and other scores, don't redo it and make sure that you are closer to others. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's good. That's the uh, that's the learning for you, right? It's like this is what I think about myself. This is what others think about me. So there is a gap. So what can I do about the gap? So it's not like like it. Uh, okay, I'm going to. Do this. What is, what is the gap? I mean, is it too much? All, all attributes? That's okay. No, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. I will tell you, a lot of people will get 25 overrated. 30, I've, I've, we have seen people like 30 overrated. All, all the upward arrow. They are all, they think they are Spider-Man, Superman, whatever it is, right? That's okay. No, don't worry. That's, that's something that you have to go deeper into and find out why. So, I will just... Oh, okay. Ramya and Mamta, right? Oh, okay. 
I have moved it to uh, Ramya. I will do it uh, once. Uh, I will do it a little later. Okay, Mamta, I'll, I'll do it a little later. The thing is, I moved all the data to analytics now. I'll, I'll have to move it back and then. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, so one I will I will share at least how. See, uh, we we do a whole lot of uh, uh, we we use a whole lot of uh, functions, formulas, and whole lot of stuff, right? So just to give you one small example, uh, sometimes uh, not sometimes. Uh, what we do, for example, let's say that you are you are looking at a group. So one is basically a simple average. One is a weighted average. Okay. Now let's say that I'm I'm looking at this group of fifteen people. Now I want to find out what is, is this group really assertive. Okay, let's assume that that's my uh, problem area. That's the problem state, statement I'm trying to address, right? So now, how will I go and do it? Now, one obviously simple, straightforward way is to go and look at the group's influence scores, right? So let's say that the group group's influence scores, including the leader. Let's assume that in this case, Shinu is the leader. Okay. So let's say that the group's influence scores, including Shinu, is for example, let's say 9.5. I'm just giving you a random example. Now, <clears throat> what we do is, if we we then go and look at what is the kind of influence that the leader is having on the team. Now, like Shinu keeps saying, right? She she says I'm a dictator, right? I'm a Hitler. In that case, what we actually do is we don't go by simple average; we go by weighted average. What I mean by that, we will take a higher percentage of Shinu scores as the group scores. What I mean by that? Let's say that. Shinu's score is on a particular attribute. Okay. Can I write here? Is it okay or is it? So let's say the aspiration score, right? I'm just giving you an example. Of the group is uh, seven. Uh, let's say uh, Shinu's group is eight. Okay, right? So typically, if I say what is the group's aspiration score? Correct. So usually I'll say it is this is the aspiration score, right? So this is the aspiration score. Now we actually do this. This is what we call a simple average. Now if Shinu is a person whose influence is high and empowerment is low, what it actually means is the group is a reflection of Shinu. Yeah. I mean, you have no room, right? You will only do what Shinu wants you to do, right? So in that case, what we do is we start assigning weightage. We will say if if the delta between these two is anywhere between 0.5 to 1, then apply this whatever x weightage to this and apply y weightage to this. Because what happens is the group will start aligning itself with an autocratic leader. Right, whether they like it or not, you report a Shinu, is it? Okay. <laughs> so what you will see is when when we when we are analyzing the group, we, we even see this on the ground, right? They will they will just they will they will actually become mirror images of the leader because they don't have a choice. I mean, people who don't like it will walk out. That's a different thing, right? But people who are in the system, they don't have a choice. They have to fall in line. So there is no point looking at what the group thinks. No point and. In certain cases, this will be like as high as 4.0. In that case, we'll just take the leader score. We'll say, forget the team. They don't exist. Right? And it is true. You don't have to talk to the team. Typically, when you talk about change management initiatives, right? You say, oh, get the buy-in from all the stakeholders. No, if you're talking about a team like this, just get the leader uh, you know, buy-in. That's enough. The leader will make sure that everybody goes through the change. <laughs> right? Just to give you an example, uh, there is a company that we work with called uh, Lupin Laboratories, right? So we kind of did this uh, assessment and analytics exercise with uh, one of their, uh, what do you call that, uh, sales teams. Uh, uh, all of you understand how a pharma industry works, right? So they have a lot of field personnel, people who go to doctors and pitch their products and things like that. And uh, so they have these hierarchies. You have regional sales managers, sales managers, and so on. So we did that with uh, with one of their sales groups, which had about 100 sales managers and regional sales managers. And we also did that with another group, which had about 60, 70 sales managers and regional sales managers. So there was there was a 
striking contrast between these two groups. In group one, which had like this hundred odd people, right? Uh, I let me also name it. It's, it was called Respira, where they make this uh, respiratory drugs or whatever. Uh, and this was some Respira specialty care or something. So when we did this, uh, there are there were both both of them had uh, the sales head, right? The national sales heads. Both of them had national sales heads. Very very autocratic. Very autocratic. You will not believe, and that's what we we told them. So we we had this. Uh, uh, we kind of interpreted the, and then we had their HR head, we had their uh, sales heads. So we were presenting their sales data to them. So we said, this hundred people, you're you're actually being run like a military force. You will not believe. Each one calls the other one a commander. They all started. They burst out, started laughing when we said this one is being run like a military unit. They all started. They were just rolling on the ground and laughing because they really call each other commander. Oh, good morning, commander. Hello, commander. I mean, it's stupid, but that's what they do. He said, and the guy who was setting it said, that is the discipline we want in our sales force. We want to take on uh, Sipla, which has uh, 500 people to sell Respira drugs. How can we take on that? We have to be an army. Their mindset is like that. We, I mean, uh, when I was explaining, I just told them you're operating like, a, like, an, like she said, I'm like Hitler, right? So I said, do you operate like an army? They said, yeah, we operate like an army. That's true. So in that case, we, then you don't even have to look at the group scores at all. We just apply the weighted average and give a very high percentage to the leader scores. So, for example, when I'm looking at another orientation, for example, in this case, we were saying, oh, your learning orientation, we are saying, uh, in this case, uh, we will say that, okay, the group is low on, uh, uh, let's say, time for learning. Then we'll go and look at what is the leader score. Because if the leader wants you to learn, you will learn. You will learn. I mean, there's no, no two ways about it. Right? Because you are dealing with an autocratic leader. So that's that's one simple thing that I gave you, right? So if you if you kind of also want to know, for example, we do this peer mentoring. How do you come up with a peer mentor? For example, in this case, if you remember, we said, hey, you are low in this particular area and there are these two or three people who can actually be peer mentors for you. So one is basically uh, some, again, some simple, uh, some simple logic that we apply uh, at the back end is, so for example, let's say that my, my planning score is seven. Right, and uh, now I have to recommended a set of peer mentors from the group that I am a part of. Okay, so let's assume that Shinu has a planning score of eight. You have a planning score of seven point five. Right, you have a planning score of eight point five, for example. So what the system does is it'll actually go and look at who else in this group has a planning score of, uh, let's say, at least one point five more than Prabhat's planning score. I mean, there are like different things. I'm just giving you a very simple example. Uh, then it'll actually go and look at, if you remember, we have something called, uh, um, go back to this. So for example, we have something called learning orientation and we have something called nursing orientation, right? So <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm kind of simplifying the algorithm for you. Okay, I'm trying to put it in sentences. What, how actually the system works in the back end. So what it will actually go and look at is, it will not, not, it'll not recommend one of you as a peer coach for me just because your score is higher than mine. It will actually go and look at what is your nurturing orientation. Now nurturing orientation is your ability to nurture people, right? And learning orientation is my ability to learn. It will actually go and we have written like a series of formulas that will actually go and look at an interplay among this to give you what we call an index score. So let's assume that you got, so what I'm telling you is how will some peer mentor be recommended from whom I can learn planning skills, okay? So it'll actually give you a nurturing score based on, we, we use at least about 10 or 12 different formulas there to see uh, what is happening across these five attributes. Based on that, we give you like an index score. And then it'll again look at how my scores are across these seven attributes and it'll give me a learning index score. And then we'll go and look at what is your nursing index score and what is my learning index score. And then we calculate the delta between the two. And the person who gets rec uh, uh, recommended as the first mentor is the one with the lowest delta. I hope I'm <laughs> right. So what we are actually trying to say is, can we make sure that the, the ability of this person to nurture me is maximum? 
see it's like this right all the five of you might be great planners that does not mean you can teach me planning all of you agree i mean i this this uh, reminds me of my college days we had uh, we had a uh, we had a guy who was iit kanpur he was teaching us mathematics everything would just go as bouncers in two steps you would do integration i mean boss we need at least 20 steps i mean we are not at your iq level just because you are good at something does not mean you can be a good mentor that's the logic so what we are trying to do there is we are trying to see what is the alignment between somebody's ability to nurture and somebody's ability to learn and only when there is an alignment that person can actually be a mentor otherwise uh, the the whole mentoring exercise will fall flat right so let me give you a simple example one of one of the things i told you how we come up with a uh, how we come up with a nurturing index right so let's assume that i am a guy who is very outspoken which means i am a guy who will share my opinions like this i don't even think twice but let's let's assume that my concern is very low i'm just giving you one of the probably 30 or 40 different things that you look at let's say my concern is very low what that means is whenever i'm talking right i'm really not worried about how you feel inside right a lot of people are very blunt and brash the moment they open their mouth you're like oh god what's coming now right so let's say that that is my i'm just giving you one small piece so let's assume that that's my nurturing orientation and let's say that you are somebody who is very sensitive right and you get put off even if somebody talks to you in a high tone now <coughs> you will not get recommended as a mentor for that person in the very first meeting you'll say what boss you didn't know this also how are you surviving in the it industry man that guy is just being he doesn't know how the other person will take it right now that person will go back crying the person is very sensitive i'm saying that's the kind of uh, what do you call that micro details that we get into to say that this person is a good mentor for this person okay so like you said what you see there on the uh, on the surface is very calm water but what's happening uh, at the back end is a whole lot of drama right a whole lot of drama 